Hello everybody, welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be talking about The Witcher Blood Origin. So, I'm not a... F okay, so I'm a fan of The Witcher, but I never played the games much. One of the games a little bit. However, a friend of mine wanted to play a Witcher in d and I'm using the second edition rules, so I converted it and did a big info dump. As I was preparing to put the character or the Witcher class into my D and D campaign, a Witcher campaign, uh, so I read the books, uh, maybe that were out at the time, and watched all the cutscenes from the movies, hours of that stuff, and so I might come from a different perspective here. The Witcher Blood Origin, to me, well, I try to balance what I have fun with with what might critically be, you know, an acclaimed series. This is not a critically acclaimed series. Can it be fun? Sure. The D&D nerd in me sees it as, you know, a, uh, an adventure you would run as a little campaign. But serious problems here. I would have done this a, a, a bit differently. But a fun you know, adventure type thing for Dungeons and Dragons type lore. Perhaps is it a enriching Witcher experience? Not really, in my opinion. And what I mean is, you should have taken these first four episodes because it's a, I guess it's a season one or a limited series four episodes. I think it was supposed to be six. I'm not sure, but you should have taken these first. Four episodes and set up the three leads it should have been a prequel to the prequel should have saw this growing love for two characters and this disdain of this third one who a tribe's been you know um decimated and it has to do with tribes or clans set it like a thousand or twelve hundred years before the witcher series you know in in itself they should have just did a four episode origin thing where you saw the seeds of affection and love between the two characters because you have four episodes you've got separate clans doing their thing mishaps things go wrong plot blah 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 and one of the main characters gets in trouble for having relations with the princess he gets you know thrown out from his clan or whatever and then immediately uh you know you got four episodes and he's the, the series turns on this pivotal moment where he is in love with the lark or the or the, the, the one of the other main characters and that love just felt like bullshit to me i i you know, granted love the actress um, I, I guess I should say it's uh, created by Declan Dabara, <laughs> Lauren Schmidt. Um, the direction from it is a little off. The writing is bad at times, but like I said, if I'm just one, I, I mean, I am that guy to please with fun romps. So Dungeons and Dragons ish. Oh, you know, you got me. But it, they should have just taken. The main character, well, one of the main characters from The Witcher, which they use as a catalyst, and I was actually intrigued, uh, whatever they call his name, Joxel, or, um, and he's from The Witcher series, The Bard, and it starts off with a battle coming on, I guess in The Witcher series time, to an extent, and he's almost killed, time stops, and a storyteller comes to him and tells him, you've got to tell the story of The Seven. When I think this series, these four episodes should have been, had nothing to do with that. Focus on the three. Set them up. Have it end with a affection love thing that can't be achieved. And then have this series go. Because I don't believe the shit that's going on. And by the way, you know, Michelle Yeoh just elevates everything. So she's awesome watching her. The, um, Sophia Brown was really good. 
the main guy who plays Fall is okay. There's a little something off about how he progresses through the show, and I'm okay with the using the F word and things like that in his language. I'm I'm okay with the premise they're setting, which they set up in The Witcher, but here's supposed to be the conjunction of the worlds and four episodes too much. It feels a little rushed. It feels like it's not polished enough. Things weren't cut out enough to focus on other things. And I think I would have appreciated a prequel to the prequel. I would have set up um, CN, Michelle Yeoh's character, Lawrence O'Farran, Fial, and Sophia Brown, Ellie, or The Lock. I would have set them up as prequels right up off the bat. Had some interaction, and, you know, you then maybe filter in Jaska from the, the Bard from the Witcher series. Because he's great in that sense. Um, I'm a fan of the Witcher series. Season 2 is better than 1, but it, it made a lot of mistakes, and... A lot of shows are doing that. Uh, I just did The Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power. And I might be able to get to that as a fun romp and recommend it for fun. But you know people who know the law are pulling their fucking hair out. You know, these people took this shit and just did what the fuck they want. Paid for rights to stuff that really doesn't, didn't help them tell their story. And here we have a franchise, beloved Witcher series franchise. Again, I haven't played the games much. But I am a dungeon master of a Witcher campaign. I did a big info dump law and did a lot of stuff. I don't find this intriguing enough to say, oh, this is uh, you know, a fascinating look into the Witcher world. I feel it's a little force. And even if you just kept them things out, like the love thing between these characters, you would have missed out on what they were trying to say at the end with the bloodline and the sea. It just doesn't work for me in the in that in the, that department in this big overall picture i would have rather had six episodes and two episodes sort of give me a little bit more um you know depth to the characters like yeah it felt like in like a weekly episode of dungeons and dragons where you're playing different characters see back in the day when you played at your house with your friends it was totally different than going to the complete strategist in Manhattan or finding setups where you had to take character sheets that were supplied to you or in some cases if you're a DM and stuff they give you you have to run an adventure that's just totally out of the blue and it has a you know beginning end type thing. So I get that mentality of watching this and just seeing it's a fun romp but you try to do too much with too little some things look really cheap and some things look pretty good, but, you know, I'm having a ball with the dwarf and some interactions, but they've got characters that just flat out don't look like they belong, don't feel like they inhabit the world, even if it is a conjunction of worlds type Witcher universe where things aren't as simple, or not, not to call Tolkien simple, but, you know, a Dungeons and Dragons world like Forgotten Realms or Kryn and... Where you're inhabiting a world that has, you know, such a base setup, a foundation that, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel, pol like I said, polished enough to be a, a, a series that wows me enough to go, hey, you know. Cause my, well, I have a friend who did some of the um, trailer reactions with me in the beginning before the pandemic hit and stuff. And, you know, I try to pick his brain. He is a unique way of looking at things in my opinion and I value is uh talks about these things and there is that balance between shutting your brain off and going look I just want to have fun and watch this fucking thing and have fun and for me it was fun and I can put things into that category but I get a feeling like if you come into the channel and you're getting an idea you know you know I'm a nerd who lets a lot of things go by and we'll give just things you know that approval of maybe recommendation to watch something, but it's because I found some joy and had some fun with it. This is a weird thing. It's inhabiting a world I, I know enough, 
And, but do I know it enough to say this doesn't fit and it's not a good precursor to The Witcher? And look, here's a spoiler alert. I mean, it's not a spoiler, but it's in the fucking descriptions. You see the origins of the first Witcher. And I thought it was bad. Uh, I don't like the Catalyst characters that I met up with and are integral to this. Talking about two mages. It just feels clunky and... I don't know, you know, just not polished enough. Like, this thing, this should have had more takes and more, you know, editing, cutting, and maybe building up of certain other things. I get the gist of it, and again, Michelle Yeoh will probably elevate anything. She's just captivating to watch it. I mean, remember her from the old Kung Fu days, you know, when she's fucking young as shit and ticking ass, uh... So way before she got popular in, you know, in modern day stuff. So she's just a pleasure to watch, you know, most everything. Is she in it enough to carry this? N- not really. And if you're going to get Sophia Brown, the actress, who I thought did a great job for what she had. And even the La- Lawrence guy who plays Raul, there's not enough for me to really attach myself and fall in love with a character, even if I want to put him in the characterization as warrior, bard, mage, cleric, you know, rogue, or thief, traditional D&D, Dungeons and Dragons stuff that I would normally do. It doesn't feel like you're allowed to do that here. These things, they have a agenda that has to be met because they have to piece this together by episode four and show you the origin of the Witcher. But then they want to show you that this whole thing had even bigger implications because of a love that brings forth the seed of a new bloodline and it's, look, spoiler alert, whatever the fuck you want to call these things. Fal, who is, you know, Elfborn clan, um, no, because all clans have names. I think he's the dog clan, which I found stupid. And whatever, some of the Raven clan, the Ghost clan, okay, whatever. The the main character, Fall, is the one who becomes the first Witcher. And right beforehand, he has a love thing, you know, they show a sex scene, which felt out of place. You know, I'm all for seeing some side boobs and some, you know, it just it doesn't work. And this woman is gorgeous, Sophia Brown. She's just, you know, stunning. And from there, love affair, at the end, she's pregnant. And I just didn't give a fuck. Like, I didn't buy it. I didn't feel it was earned in any way. So that's why I might have had a more, two or more. And yeah, according to the story, uh, Fall, whatever the fuck his name is, F-J-A-L-L. Fall is meeting... Um, the lock for the first time. So, if you're gonna do that, you had to have two more episodes in there or something showing this affection growing and showing the stakes of their caring for each other, you know, kind of growing. And like I said, this bad placement of actors, not that they're bad actors, or maybe one or two are, sorry, just how good are you at your talent? I don't know. But they don't feel right, they don't fit right, and they jaw, they just pull you out of everything. And that's a problem, because this isn't a show like um, Law and Order or whatever, I know, more of a modern, real-life take on a police officers from a state, and you go, off. I'm from Chicago, I'm watching Chicago CSI, this is bullshit, like, this is a fantasy world that we're, in, we're, we're being drawn in, we want to inhabit. And it's the beginning of something major, right? How the Witcher was formed. How uh, the quest to find other worlds is... uh, Brings about a calamity, kind of, at the end. Even though it's a win, technically, you know, in defeating the... um, Just, I didn't like the fucking villains in this. Holy shit. Um, Just don't buy it. Didn't give a fuck. 
Again, though, I'm watching the old Dungeons & Dragons movie with fucking Marlon Wayans who, destro- who fucking ruined that fucking movie, but I even watch all the other ones. Like, there's four of them. And, or one of them was really fucking bad. And there were two that were just okay D&D adventures in my mind. Maybe not something I'm going to keep recommending or whatever, but D&D friends, I'm like, oh, we should watch this together. And we watch it, you know. I don't like what this thing, you know, put the put out in a four-episode arc. I don't think it works for, you know, you know, strengthening the Witcher series or its fan base or its franchise. I don't think so. Like, and I did the review on the Resident Evil show, which had some great elements to it. But, in my opinion, it, it hurt Resident Evil's franchise more than it helped, whereas the Emilia Jovovich movies, as god-awful as some of them are, but fun popcorn romps that I'll just fucking watch, I think they strengthened the Resident Evil. Right? Now, maybe it was because of the time and place where, you know, the movies came out, there was not much going on with Resident Evil, or, you know, just the video games. And we know video games sell more than fucking movies, I, I get it, but... You know, are you saying that the the Witcher game can go on and make billions of dollars with every iteration it comes out with, whether it's Witcher 4 or 5 or 6, and that's the main focus and that's what really matters? Sure, maybe a show like this does help. Um, You know, you're filling the blanks and you're reading the books. Uh, Like I said, this show is about 1,000 or 1,200 years before the Witcher series. Now, the Witcher series has its own problems, but you can see it could be easily cost-corrected, which they did more for the most part in Season 2. But it has a bigger problem now. Henry Cavill left as the Witcher, and they're replacing him, his character, Geralt, with another actor. So, I think you're in a little bit of a bind here, because I would have just taken Geralt out of the equation and had another Witcher, Leaving the door open for like two years down the line, Geralt comes back. You could have shifted the storyline easily, but now you're going to ask the audience to take in a new actor playing the role that Henry Cavill loved. And because you could read behind the scenes stuff, like he would sit around playing the uh, game that they play in the game. Like he really got into it, he's a big fan, and he's like one of those guys that puts together their own, their own computer and builds it and stuff like that. And I get it. I don't know the intricacies and why he left for real. Did he get pushed out? Would I don't know. But the Witcher series has a lot riding on things like this, in my opinion, because I'm not the game guy. And um, I'll probably see, you know what? I should say Happy New Year. Uh, and I'll finish this up with a Happy New Year, I guess. But I'm going to watch the animated series, too. Or, and it's not a series. I'm sorry. It's like an animated movie. It's called like The Witcher. Um, uh, Nightmare of the Wolf and it focuses on a young Vesemir who is like Geralt's um, uh, you know his friend or his you know mentor so to speak that grew, raised him in the Witcher society whatever and I'm going to do that also but I don't know how I look at this and go the Witcher franchise is enriched. Because for me, it's just a and d nerd who likes an adventure. <laughs> I want to see the warrior and the thief and the mage go on an adventure and use their abilities. And they tried here and there, and I just didn't buy it in total. Again, it's hard for me separating, you know, emotions of something that's fun that I get through and laugh and giggle. and Something I'm going to analyze as a critical piece of film. Is this going to wow people? Uh, No, it's not. It's just not. There are problems in the writing and editing. Again, I think it could have been kind of fixed with a little bit more dedication and growth with two of the three main characters. And start bringing in the other characters that really fit.
You know, by the time we fall in love with the dwarf and her hammer, Gwen, she's been filtered through the show, but really doesn't resonate until she's with the group. And remember, this is four episodes. It's what, an hour or five each? I don't know, maybe about an hour or so. Um, it doesn't pay off for me. I don't feel it. I mean, there's some good setup, some pretty decent uh, battle stuff, and again, the show yo just kicks ass all the time. But can she? She doesn't elevate the writing and the editing where I'm supposed to believe two characters who are in love, and their love at the end starts a new generation. So is it the fact that the first witch was created? He had to be destroyed in a sense, you know, becoming deformed and losing control. But does the bloodline mean witches can be made from that bloodline? Or are they saying that the bloodline is what creates the the bond that they, he has, like with the girl who can see other worlds and has visions in, in the game so she could teleport and travel? So, I mean, I'm not sure. Are we looking at. A bloodline actually is where they pick in the future who can be a witcher, who survives the process. I mean, that's kind of weird. Again, or is it set up these predestined super powerful beings, like the young girl in the first season who Geralt is tied to with his, um, you know, they make the, what a, the customary shit they do where you owe something. I get some of the things the show does, The Witcher primary itself, and where it tried to go. Again, I have lots of issues with season one. But, you know, looking back at shows like The Mandalorian, also, you might get fun going through it, but it's not perfect. It just has enough charm, you know, to get me through and smile and giggle. Whereas The Book of Boba Fett, I found somewhat annoying at parts. And I haven't even gotten to Andor yet. Um... I'm looking at the Halo I did, and there's a failure here. You've got eight episodes, six episodes, and maybe you're, you know, pressed for time and what you're going to do, what you're going to leave in. Netflix's 12 to 13 episodes felt like a good sweet spot for some of these things. But then uh, shows that I love, like the Hawkeye show or the WandaVision, I feel that these shows need to breathe. I would have liked to have had... Alright, so let's say you started this show off the first two episodes, and then the next two were just drawing out um, bonding and elements between the characters. It doesn't feel like you have enough time for that. And then these guys come together, seven of them, and his narration it just doesn't work on all levels. And I, that's where I find myself really looking at this like, yeah, the D&D nerd in me is going to watch this and, you know, smile at times and it'll ignite some of my creative flows or past adventures I had. Because there were times I'm like, hey, this is a smart move. Choke him in this corridor. You know, we're not that many people. And it kind of works and someone breaks formation and it causes this. Like, I get it. And there were actually some... Uh, dialogue in there about working as a clan, uh, working together and these are things like when you play D&D are highlighted by your fight or classes or you know, plays that are played for a long time and I can feel those elements in here and it does, you know, get me in certain places like I said, again, you see Michelle Yeoh show up on the screen, she does her thing it's sometimes just a beauty to behold but it can't elevate everything um, like the Resident Evil show, there were so many good elements. Look, I talk about Walking Dead, I can't fucking stand that show. I, I struggled through um, a couple of seasons, then got to season 6 by the end, and got to like, you know, season 10. It's just a fucking struggle. And I don't like it. But, actors and setups, some of those things are awesome and amazing. Another one, Game of Thrones. These things aren't Game of Thrones. And I think... You know, it might be a greater crime in the Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power, because, you know, they put like a billion dollars for five seasons. But 
as someone who doesn't really enjoy Game of Thrones, who recognizes some of the greatness and how they set the bar high, it might be impacting things more than people think or more than the industry recognizes that they keep going for that. And I think this doesn't really care, which is a little refreshing in that sense, but when they try to do what they do and get it mixed in and all blended in four episodes, I think that was the problem here. I think this needed two episodes to really flesh out, to really bond some of the characters. Now, like I said, the dwarf and some of the other, the other ancillary characters are okay coming in and not knowing much about them. In a way, it kind of works for just the suspense and mystery of things and who are they really, you know, could do, you know, and filtering in Jasker from the first or the original, the prime Witcher series was probably a good idea because I immediately was intrigued and it captivated me right from the beginning. But it loses me in weird camera angles of skies and landscapes that aren't captivating. It seems like they're almost hiding what they can't really perform. And then there were some great moments of battle. There were some interesting aspects to this. And then I get pulled out by the stupid, dumb villain type things where people just don't feel real in this world. And I've read books like the Shinara series where the Shinara series says, no, our world happened. And he did a great fucking thing, in my opinion. He did, like, books in the modern world and... They're actually part of his Shinara world, but it's just done amazingly. Uh, Terry Brooks is like my favorite. And the Shinara is what happened to our world after, you know, nuclear war, sentient computers, all that shit. Magic came back eons, thousands of years later. And we've got the Shinara series prime or whatever you want to call it. So there is a, you know, a, a method to lots of fantasy lore to say, Hey, this is a new world. Like, they will dress this way. Um, like, you see landscapes. Like, it's not, it wouldn't be jarring to me watching a Shinara series. Oh, don't let me talk about that show. I'm fucking so pissed off at that show. Where on a landscape, you see a grass covered skyscraper. Right? Or someone's wearing clothing that they found, like, it mimics something we might recognize in the modern world. I'm okay with that. It's when the fabric looks cheap, it doesn't look right on their body, it doesn't feel lived in and real enough, that it breaks that connection. And then I'm trying to get into these characters and the world, and like I said, there's too much put on me that I don't care or feel like I'm involved in any of this growth in learning about the characters and how they're going to become lovers that twist everything and Make the future possible. It's just not not riveting enough. It's not um, epic enough. It feels a little bland and thrown together. I think you really could have taken characters like Brother Death and his connection to the two mages that we kind of see. Because we're dealing with an elf world and class things like you know, lowborn, commonborn, all this shit. And, you know, those things are there to, you know, keep your foundation. But when you're intertwining it into a plot with hierarchies and empresses and kings and who's the real power, and you're focusing on a group of seven bringing the song back, you got four episodes to do that. And you don't pull it off in an epic way. Again... Could this be a fun romp? And it probably is. Cause it could be. It is for me in that sense. You know, I'm fifty, gonna be fifty-two, playing D and D for over forty years, D and Dungeon Master for over thirty. Just enamored with all this stuff. When I read my books and I can look at character sheets and go over them, I don't feel it here. That connection that really awes me. And by the way, there's a Dungeons and Dragons movie coming around the corner that um, I'm trying to avoid all shit on. And that's another thing. But I see these things as that. I see them as extensions of 
role-playing Dungeons and Dragons and adventures and this is a piece of that is just a you know, fun adventure with a warrior, a rogue, a blade master, whatever you want to call him, a dwarf. And yes, you're dealing with mainly a elven world, but an elven world that obviously had dwarfs and other things going on. So are we really talking about an elf dominated world where humans are there and because at the end, it's kind of surprising that worlds have blended and humans are there with elves. But was it odd to see a dwarf with the elves? Like, I thought it would have been just an elven world, totally, with class problems, right? So, everyone's an elf. And you're either lowborn, commonborn, highborn, whatever the fuck they were doing. But if you're already interjecting dwarfs and people who you can't tell are fucking elves, it, it blurs the line for me. And yes, maybe I'm thinking of, you know, a Tolkien-esque version of elves, because even they did it right in the sense of, of the show, let's say, you know, the books are awesome. and That uh, elves are esoteric, they're aloof, they seem detached, they're very thoughtful and take time to think, that type of thing. But when you look at Legolas' actions, when he's given his moments, he's a super soldier. He's a fucking, you know, a super endurance, agility, speed. He's got it all, right? Accuracy, aim. You fuck things up when humans are elves. And it's weird. Now, I get it. It's your own world, and you're doing your own thing. But there's a reason why these type of, you know, templates are there. Orcs, ogres, whatever the fuck you want to call them, dragons, uh, you know, the races are a part of this stuff. You know, the elves, the half-elves, uh, hobbits or halflings, and the, you know, it just goes on. And when you talk about new Dungeons and Dragons, let's call it 5e and all the iterations, you've got half-dragon characters, supernatural beings in our races, vampires, like, it goes all over the place, but you still keep a template of what you think certain things would be. And yes, if throughout the elves, there's been wild elves, high, like you can make them distinct and whatever, but this doesn't feel like that. It feels like everybody's a human with prosthetic ears, and it's um, hard to distinguish what makes them an elf. Now, clearly, you know, you have the dwarf and She's fucking amazing in it. I, I love her. She's just not enough of her growth in, in it. But, um... You, you, feel that, you feel that, right? And there's only one dwarf in the whole show. So... And you know what? Maybe she's not a dwarf. Maybe she's just a small elf. A Kryn has, um... Tender. Which were the chaos magic from the gem. Anyway. They're like... A cross between a dwarf and an elf, slender, small, like little jockeys, you know, like how small and anyway, pointy ears. And I said, like, I, I don't feel the distinction here that makes me say this is elf and this is elf problems. Oh, and then we have a human world with human problems and human conditions because at the end, it's a bleeding of the worlds into each other. What is the purpose of that when? I didn't see that distinctiveness in the elves. Are you going to make the humans esoteric and aloof? And like, are you seeing it all bleed into each other? Because it's one thing to show racial ethnicity and having, you know, black, brown, whatever, white people mixed into a village and understanding that that village is a melting pot where in the north they look pale and white and you know, more European and South, they're more dark skinned and like there are methods that are used and I think they did a bad uh, mixture of that in the Lord of the Rings. Although I think I might give more of a pass to the Wheel of Time. Uh mainly because the books of the Wheel of Time are CW shit. So that intertwining relationship stuff was so fucking heavy in these books. And those books were nine hundred pages fucking long. 
So I get the deep dive you have to do in distinguishing things, and I don't think this show really focuses and gives you a clear picture and a distinct aspect of what elves were. Not at all. Maybe Michelle Yeoh, because this is the way she plays the character, you know, um, the ghost tribe and what was done to her tribe and whatever, because all the tribes eventually get kind of, you know, taken out. And like I said, the villains in this are so weak. The other side of this is so weak and cheap feeling that it doesn't pay off enough that you got a great actor uh, doing fall and Sophia Brown is Ellie the Lark. And, you know, you've got um, the guy who plays Jack. You know, what the fuck is his real name? Joey Beatty playing the bard from the Witcher series, and he's only in it for a couple of seconds at the beginning and at the end. And it was enough to get me glued in. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm there. But it's one thing to have, like, I don't know if it's speech patterns and things like that should be a little different and distinct. Like, the Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power, just fucked that up. Right? It's just... Lucky I'm just a nerd enough for the Tolkien stuff. And I even recognize the, you know, butchering of the law. And again, I try to balance that with, you know, being a writer and saying, you know, okay, someone's taking this vision. Are they being faithful to it? No. I can't really dedicate or make a pronouncement on this with The Witcher. Maybe it is part of everything that elves are just like everybody else in that sense. They're just... Have different, like, maybe they live a little longer, or they could jump higher, like, I don't fucking know. And you don't get that in this show. And I think that's a detriment, right? We're talking about the elven world, and before the conjunction of the worlds, and I don't know, I'm not savvy enough with this to go, okay, I can give you the whole story, but basically, you're looking at an elf world, and then, because you're trying to open pathways with these monoliths, you get peeked into other worlds, and Let's say one world is an elf world, one world is a human world, one world is a dwarf world, one world is a fucking monster world. Like, okay, I get it, and you're bleeding it all together. I just don't find the tapestry of this thing intriguing enough. Like I said, the, um, you know, the, the costumes and the, the tailoring and the fabric and the angles of this world... One thing that happens when you put a billion dollars into a show, like the Lord of the Rings show, is that it's fucking stunning. Yeah, they might be feeding you garbage and whatever, but it's stunning. And I found this was lacking, you know, in that area. So sometimes I'll give a little praise for people who, like, had a love of something and did their best to put it together. I don't think this is it. I think this is a rush job to feed the Witcher franchise and... Is it doing more harm than good? I don't know. But in the end, it's a weird recommendation if you're a fan of The Witcher. But if you're not, I don't know. But if you're just like a beast master, sword and sorcery guy, you know, a little bit of campy, a little bit of bad acting and fitting of characterization, but the whole thing just carries you, then maybe. But this is not something I'm super excited about to talk and give people, you know, my, you know, sit and, we're going to sit and talk about this show for, like, hours, you know, like we would the Lord of the Rings show, the Halo show, where, you know, I pick the brains of my friends that I have an interest in what they think and how they're going to view things, or even interested in talking about, you know, films and stuff, but this is not going to be one of those things, I'm sorry, I just don't feel it. Again, this could be just a, you know, settling in of things with, First season, like what they're setting up, I don't know. But if it's a prequel to The Witcher, when we're getting The Witcher, we're not going to keep getting these. I'm not sure. Um, you know, so I guess I'll end that here. Again, I think this is coming out. I started this in the middle. But Happy New Year's, everybody. Here's to things being better. More love and happiness. More generosity. More caring for each other in this world. Uh, my love to all my family and friends. You know who you are. And to anybody who comes and partakes and listens to my stupid podcast. Happy New Year. I hope that holidays are great for you. 
My love to you and yours. Take care.